one of our uh, longest running, I think actually Tim was the original OG. Uh, Tim Hare, who's uh, Dennis's partner at Sarah Ventures. Um, Sarah Ventures, I like to say that they used to be in the research park, but we see them more now that they're actually moved into a different building. Um, I don't know why that is, it's just a strange thing, but we work very closely with Dennis and team, um, and Sarah Ventures is now a big part of the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, and we work very closely with that, and I know many of you are here today who are part of that program as well, so it's good to see you all. Um, but Dennis has been in this business for a long time, and this isn't his first rodeo, actually this was your second venture capital firm, so um, he's, he's sort of been around the block from a variety of different perspectives, so we're very grateful that he offered to give this talk today, and I will hand over the mic to Dennis. Awesome, thank you. The question is, can it work with technology? It works. Okay, so I put a deck together with a bunch of pages, and there's some fine print in here and bullets, and I, I did that partially because I, just a week or so ago, I looked at somebody's deck where I did not see the presentation, and I was horrified because it was all just pictures. And I couldn't just read the deck and know what was going on. I needed to be at the top. So there's a more bullet points and, and narrative uh, and uh, text here than you might normally see. But uh, you should all get a copy of this uh, in PDF format so you can look at it later. Because there might be a couple of things in here that are interesting to, to reference as you go forward. And we don't have time to really cover everything about venture capital, so I'm going to high spot a few things. But uh, just a quick background on me. I had. Um, I, as Laura mentioned, I was with Open Prairie Ventures, and I, I started working with them as an advisor just because I knew the guys and they needed some specific help that I had expertise in, and kind of grew into eventually a partnership role. And uh, Laura Appenzeller here introduced me to the people at iSight who were right here in the research park. This goes back in 2007, and that was one of the investments I made, and it turned out to be a nice success. And long story short, uh, Tim started Sarah Ventures, and I joined him shortly thereafter. We still have a working with Open Prairie Ventures as well. And so um, I've been doing this for almost 20 years, actually. Um, so it's, it's been really fun. And um, uh, I'm a former uh, 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 CPA auditor with PricewaterhouseCoopers, and I was controller of a scientific instrument company here in town. Then I bought my own company and ran that for a few years, which fits us all in together at, at Sarah, where all uh, former CEOs and partners are. Anyway. Uh, yeah, Sarah, uh, former CEOs, we have our main offices here in Champaign, but we have a couple of folks in Chicago and San Diego and Park City, Utah. We're primarily in the Midwest and the West Coast, although with our latest fund, which is an ag tech investment fund, we can invest anywhere in the world. We've done, uh, I think, just one in Canada so far on that fund, but we can look at everything and we have looked at stuff everywhere. Um, yeah, we're managing about $150 million, and as I'll explain in a minute, that's really small in the venture capital world. Um, but uh, for what we do, which is pretty early stage, uh, if we get a whole lot bigger, uh, it changes the way we do business. So we have to think carefully about doing things that might seem obvious. Um, and uh, we've done everything, uh, medical devices, scientific instruments, SaaS, uh, you know, hardware, software, and, and ag tech all along. And, and just without getting into the long story, just through some quirks, our latest fund is just ag. And, um, and we may not do that with our next fund, we may or may not, but it meshed nicely with our work with the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, so we're all ag, and we had some experience with it, and we had some success with it, which is why we were able to attract investors to us, which has a lot to do with what I'm gonna talk about today. So what I wanted to talk about is what is venture capital, and uh, uh, we, we can get into some of this. A lot of times when you uh, see somebody talk about venture capital to a group of entrepreneurs, what they're explaining is, what are the terms, what you, should you expect? And we get into a little bit of that. But um, uh, I also have served as a lecturer in the College of Business, and when I talk to my students in the College of Business about venture capital, I'm telling them how a venture firm works from the venture capitalist side. And I, I believe, just like in a lot of negotiations, if you understand what the people on the other side of the table are trying to do, you'll have a better understanding of how maybe you can meet them in the middle when you're negotiating terms or trying to do a deal. And um, as much as, um, I know this is being recorded, I'm gonna take a chance to say it anyway. We have a friend who just wrote a novel and, uh, and my wife was reading the novel, this was just a couple of weeks ago, and she got to the point, it was a murder mystery, and guess what the bad guy did for a living? <laughs> 
was a venture capitalist. <laughs> and really driving the stake in is, I think I'm the only venture capitalist that our friend, the writer, knows. So I'm helping the model for the murderer. And uh, it's easy to paint venture capitalists as sort of greedy types who are out to grab everything they can. And I think if I can give you, if I can give you a little bit of an explanation of how we work, you'll understand why the dots connect the way they do, and why sometimes we can't do everything you might want on a deal. So that's where we're going to go with this. But a quick definition of venture capital is a, it's a type of private equity. You hear that term slung around, and private equity differs from public equity. So it's easier to explain a lot of times what public equity is, and that's shares and companies that are, are bought and sold, traded on exchanges. Anybody in the public can buy them. So the most famous here in America are the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ Exchange, and companies like Microsoft and, and, uh, and uh, Twitter are uh, traded on these exchanges, and, and you can get online using your Ameritrade app on your phone and buy some shares anytime, and sell them anytime. Well, that's not what we're doing. Uh, we're working with companies like yours who are trying to raise some equity. You're trying to get partners, and we do it in the form of equity. If you're an accountant, you understand how a balance sheet is lined up, and uh, the equity is the bottom level on the liabilities and equity side of the balance sheet which means it's the last to get paid off. That's the bad news. The equity holders are carrying all the risk, including you founders. The good news is, if the company becomes worth a whole lot and you start generating a lot of cash flow profits or you sell the company for a bunch of money, all the stuff above the equity is usually paid off for a defined amount and you get to keep the residual. So what I'd like to explain is the uh, the debt and the payables uh, are limited to either the face value or in the case of a bank loan or something like that, the face value plus interest, whereas the equity has all the risk but it has unlimited upside. So as you'll see in, our, in my explanation here, we need to get a hold of that unlimited upside on successful companies uh, in order to do what we've been charged with doing. We typically put cash in companies in exchange for shares to, to simplify it and uh, we, we get our return usually, almost always, through a liquidity event where the company is sold to another company, even a bigger company, or if the company goes public so that their shares then can be traded on the exchange and the investors like the venture capital firm or the employees and founders can go to the exchange and sell some of their shares or all of their shares in exchange for cash. And, and we've done deals both ways. Uh, we do primarily five things. It's, it's simple to understand. It's very hard. We raise money from investors. We'll get back to that in a minute. We find companies to invest in, sourcing. There's an easy part of that and there's a hard part of that. The easy part is people are lined up to get our money. The hard part is figuring out which ones are the best ones to get this limited amount of money that we have to invest. So we have to choose, and that's hard. Uh, that we negotiate and close the deal. So if you come to me and say, Dennis, I need a half a million, I'm raising a million dollars, would you put in a half a million? Well, we have to negotiate. What do I get? How much of your company do I get? What other terms come along with these shares? That can be challenging. It happens pretty quickly, usually in a matter of weeks or a couple of months. Then the long time thing that goes on here is uh, we help the companies grow. The, the active venture capital firms will do that. There are passive investors in this private equity world who will just put the money in and you're on your own. But in early stage, there's almost always a lead investor in every round, sometimes two, and hopefully your lead investor is somebody that brings something to the table, experience, expertise, com, uh, contacts, uh, uh, the kinds of things that will help you be successful. And, and it takes often, most companies take years. We rarely are able to realize an exit within five years of an investment. And I'll show you how our funds are set up. We don't expect that. In fact, there are advantages to holding on to the investment for longer than five years, tax advantages. And then we help the firms get to exit. I mentioned that all of us have been CEOs at Sarah. We've all not only sold our companies, we've helped a lot of other people sell their companies, either through our prior jobs or through our work in venture capital. So um, most entrepreneurs, unless they've been pretty successful more than once, don't have much experience in doing this kind of work. And so that's something we can definitely bring to the table. Uh, how do we break down VCs? I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you can break them down by what industry they serve, like healthcare versus IT, uh, by size. Uh, funds under 100 million or small funds or even micro funds, and that's the space we play in. 
big funds are usually funds a billion dollars or more. There are a lot of those, especially on the coasts. Uh, geography. Uh, we're, we were primarily a Champaign and Illinois based firm and we grew into a Midwest and then to a, a, a Midwest and West Coast and now I guess we take a world view, although we haven't uh, directly invested. Uh, we've invested through the accelerator in several company, countries, but uh, directly only in Canada <coughs> so far. We'll see where that goes. And then another important thing for you to know is what stage you, these investors invest in. And, and they're usually quick to identify themselves even on your website. You can see whether venture capitalists have spoken on seed and early stage versus middle, sort of getting into the growth stage, versus what is more like private equity, the late stage, where maybe a company has hit cash flow rate even or they're profitable, and they just need more capital to grow and expand. Okay, just a, a quick illustration, sort of the seed uh, started up the pre-revenue stage. Uh, early on, Tim and I were doing almost all pre-revenue. We've grown to where we do almost all post-revenue companies. In fact, we like to see 500,000 to a million in revenue or more before we come in now uh, because it shows that the company has proven that there's at least some fit with the market. We don't have to do it that way. That's something we prefer to do. And so who are the investors? Uh, Laura mentioned friends and family rounds, the founder savings, that usually comes in at the, the very startup C level. Then you start to see angel investors, professional, or individuals who like to invest similar to venture funds, same kinds of investments, similar terms. And then you see the professional firms, the institutions, which are venture capital firms. So what do we want? Well, it depends on the stage, but let's focus on early because that's what we do. We're looking for companies that are serving big markets. And you'll see when we get to the math pages here why the markets have to be big to work for us and our investors. Um, so we want an emerging fast growing market, large billions of potential, not millions, not necessarily with the thought that you're going to be a multi-billion dollar sales company, but there's that much out there for you to grab, so you've got room to grow. You're not going to take over from the incumbents or from whatever customers are doing today overnight. Um, but we want you to we want you to have plenty of room. Arguably, maybe the most important, maybe the second most important, but certainly right up there with market, I think probably more important is the team. It's kind of fairly easy for us to identify some interesting markets. Uh, fairly easy, we're doing some research and focusing, but it's not easy to pull together a team that are expert, motivated, they have a vision, they've picked out a strategy, maybe they pulled in players to actually start making it happen and even have some seed money. So uh, it's really important that we find a team that we can work with and um, that we all have a similar vision on where this is going to go. And uh, I made a couple mistakes earlier in my career investing with teams that really didn't have the same vision that we had. In fact, it turned out that they didn't even know what to expect by having another investor in their company. And, it, and sometimes it doesn't end well. And, uh, and then I like to see uh, companies really have thought out a business model. Uh, uh, my friend Larry Geese over at the College of Business likes to say we look for teams that are really smart and have a strategy. But they can't always pick the right strategy and sometimes you don't know if you have the right strategy until you roll up your sleeves and give it a go. But if you have a smart team, they can move quickly and pivot a little bit and change their strategy to something that will work. And I would say we see that a lot in our companies that we back that things change, and that's okay. But hopefully you'll have a good business model and a good strategy that looks like it could work. And, and if we invest in a company that's already got, say, a million dollars a year in sales, they've probably gotten most of that figured out, maybe. And um, last but not least, and this can be hugely important, um, maybe not as important as some people think, and sometimes very, very important, is what kind of technology or defensible uh, strategic advantage do the companies have? And um, if you're working in the life sciences, say, you might have patents that uh, give you a ton of protection. You partner with OTM, the university, or other organizations like that. You've got a partner in the technology that can help you understand how to, what to defend and what you've got that's valuable. If you have software, you might not be able to get much on patent protection. You just have to be speed to market and uh, try to beat everybody else there. But maybe your product's just really good and you have a great team and, and everything in between. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, my partner Rob put this one together. Uh, he's the White Sox fan in the office. And, and uh, what this is trying to illustrate, it, 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 I don't want to dwell on it too long, but basically what it says is 
um, we end up playing for some, uh, some big home runs, which uh, loosely defined here is uh, we get 10 times our money back at the end. And I'll, I'll flesh this out with a little bit of arithmetic in a minute. So we're out looking for deals like that. And in the end, about 20% of our deals turn into home runs. About 30% turn into sort of base hits, less than 10x return, but some sort of profit. And then about half of them are, uh, are uh, strikeouts and zero to less than the amount we invested in there. And that can be half of the portfolio. And this is a typical portfolio in early stage venture capital, how it works out. So you end up getting a bunch of your money from a fairly back, from a fairly small number of deals and a fairly small amount of the cash invested. And, and of course, when you make the investment, every deal looks like it's got the potential to be the home runner. You wouldn't have made the investment. At least we've learned to think that way. And we used to joke about, um, in the office, about this one's going to be a 10Xer. Well, I don't want a 10Xer, I want a 100Xer. And <laughs> we'd all laugh about that. But there are deals done where once you hit your stride, the equity gets unlimited upside. And trust me, if we get 100X, the founders are going to be very happy because they're going to make a lot more money on the deal than you. By the way, I don't even know if I put it in the slide. We never have majority ownership. And it's pretty common that the VCs together don't have majority ownership. Although if you need a lot of capital to get to the finish line, your investors may end up with majority as a group. But rarely do investors take majority. We're usually owning a sliver of 5 to 10% of the company. So if we're doing well, uh, the founders should be doing very, very well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the economics of this. This is kind of the heart of what I want to say. Um, we're in the business of providing attractive returns to our investors. So a little background on Sarah, which is probably not typical for some VC funds, but Tim uh, started Sarah Ventures to be a consultancy to help people commercialize their ideas, primarily stuff that was coming out of the university. And he had had experience with that on more than one company. And I had bandwidth while I was working for Open Prairie, so I joined him. And we started helping uh, postdocs and professors and grad students and recent grads turn their ideas. And sometimes they were licensing the technology from the university. Sometimes they had their own technology. And everybody needed help raising money. So we were going around to all these people we knew. We were putting some of our own money in. We had both sold our own companies within the last couple of years. And, and we said, this, there's got to be an easier way to do this. So we said, let's form a fund. And we rounded up some people we knew in this area. And we put a small fund together. First one was five million, which is tiny in the venture capital world. But what we tell them is, we're finding some interesting companies, and we think we can get get you a nice return on the, these dollars through our mechanism of investing in these small companies. So all of a sudden, the game changed for us personally, and this is really weighs heavy on me all the time. You you feel the crush of hiring people at your company and being responsible for the payroll. And if you've taken investors' money, you feel I feel the same way about the money we take from our limited partners. And these are people we get to know, and we meet with them. We communicate with them monthly. We have an annual meeting and a spring mid-year meeting. And uh, we're making promises to them that we can get them a good return on their investment. We invest, we organize these as limited partnerships. You don't have to be an expert, but Alan Sink will tell you all about it. He sets up our limited partnerships. And we put an estimated life on these partnerships, 10 years. So what that means is if you want to sign on and be one of my investors, let's just say you really hit it big with your company and you're going to be saying, you know, I've got to spare a million here, Dennis. I want to put a million in your new fund. And if that happens, come and see me. I'll be happy to bring you on your family. And what I, 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 you don't have to give me a check for a million dollars to do that. You're going to commit to put a million dollars in. And we call the capital in periodically as we find companies to invest in. And that might take three or four years. And sometimes funds don't ever call the full amount in because they get to a point where they say, okay, we're through what we call the defined investment period, four or five year period. We're not investing any more new companies. We're gonna hold some back for future needs and maybe you just don't ever have all of those needs. So, um, but most of the time you get 100% of your capital called in or something pretty close to it. I had one investor, uh, and, and it was my, my friend Jack, uh, not this Jack, but my, my friend Jack out on the East Coast. and. and Jack was putting in $100,000 into our second fund, and I'm on the phone with Jack, and he goes, who do I make a check out to? And I said, well, you make it out to Sarah Capital to LP. And I said, Jack, you aren't writing a check for $100,000 now. You're writing a check for twenty because we're calling cap 20% on the first call. It's just silent on the other end. I don't. 
No, just 20. He had forgotten that part. Let me talk to my wife. We might want to invest more than $100,000. So he thought he was having to write a check for the full thing. You don't do that. And so these investors are putting it in. We've got 10 years, in theory. We've got some mechanisms to stretch it a little bit to call that capital in. In other words, find companies to invest in, help those companies grow, and then get out of those investments, probably by an exit, hopefully, uh, with uh, where we sold to another company, or maybe you go public. And, uh, and then return all that money back to the investors. And we, we tend to pay the money back as soon as we get it. We're working on an exit right now for this month with one of our portfolio companies. And I just had a call with the CEO a couple of days ago, and I think the deal is gonna close 10 days from tomorrow or something like that. And so that'd be what, a week from next Monday, I think, something like that. And they'll, they'll distribute the money to an escrow agent who also distributes all the money. It'll take a few days for that to happen, but the goal is we'll all have our money in October. Within three days or so of us getting that money into our account, we'll turn around and distribute it to all of our LPs in that fund. That's how that works. Our limited partners are, uh, the, so we're the general partners. Tim and Rob and Steve and I are, the, we, we have a firm that we call the general partnership and we're the owners of that, which means we make the decisions and we have the unlimited liability if we mess this up. The investors have our limited partners so they don't participate in the management and their liability if things go haywire is limited only to the amount they have invested. So they have some protection there. Our limited partners are, and, and, and venture capital firms in general, are retirement plans, endowments, family offices, and wealthy individuals. There is a requirement that they have to be accredited investors. So for an individual, it's a net worth of a million bucks or high income for three years in a row, that kind of thing. Um, but everybody can sort of be assumed to be sophisticated. The bigger the fund is, the more you see the big pension plans and endowments is the best as the investors. Uh, without going into all the rules, you can talk to Alan or somebody about this under Reg D where it's effectively limited to 100 investors. So you start doing the math, if you've got a billion dollar fund and you can only have 100 investors, the investors are big. So they're probably not people. Uh, they're probably institutions. Um, the thing to keep in mind here, and we're going to this just a, on the next slide a little bit more, these, these limited partners have rational choices. We entrepreneurs, and I'm an entrepreneur, we entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit emotional. We tend to lock in on what we think is really cool and really exciting. But these investors have almost an unlimited number of choices, and they try to step back and be rational if they can, and spread their investments and diversify and, and just do the right, right thing with their money so that they're getting the right returns. And, uh, uh, and they can choose stocks and real estate and mutual funds and bonds and any number of things that they can invest in. So come, come to this with that in mind. So imagine uh, you just uh, had several million dollars fall into your lap and your job is to invest in that. What kind of considerations are gonna go through your mind when you start making your choices? Hopefully, you, you know, you'll get, if you don't have experience with this, you'll get some expert advice and talk to people who are managing money. And you, you're going to look at, at, at the return. You're going to look at inflation-adjusted returns. You're going to look at the risk related to each investment. And that risk could mean anything from a timing risk to a pricing and volatility, a pricing risk to just the risk of will I get it back or not. Uh, I mentioned liquidity. How quickly, if I want to sell it, can I get paid for it? societal impact may be really important to you. Uh, also, you may want to invest in things that you know something about, which isn't a bad strategy, by the way. When you're buying and selling public stocks, people tend to do better if it's something they understand a lot more. Warren Buffett's a kind of a leading, a thought leader in that area. They won't invest in things they don't understand. Imagine that. Um, the result is uh, early stage venture capitalists. You heard what I just said, 10 year life into small companies, some of which may not even have revenues yet. Uh, this is risky. It's illiquid and it's risky. And I told you earlier, about half of them fail. So what does that mean? We've got to get a pretty good return. Anybody care to volunteer what they think the average return is on a very broad portfolio of US stocks over the last 120 years is? Long term, average. 5%? Anybody else? 3%? Somebody say 11? 11? That's the closest. It's around 10. 10, 11. Depending on what period of time you pick out. 
So, so think about this for a minute. Broad portfolio of publicly traded stocks, I can get 11% return on my money average year after year after year. It's, it's up and down. Not as crazy as venture capital, but it's up and down. So if you're investing for the long haul, if you're 30 years old and retiring for when you turn, or uh, saving for when you retire at age 70, you can throw this all into stocks and you can probably, without too much work, buy some low cost index funds and get 11% return. By the way, my, my funds are averaging a little over 10% that I started investing when I was in my early 20s. They just chug right along. And you know you can sell these real easy now. I mentioned use your Ameritrade app. You can be playing golf. You make an investment before you tee off on the first hole, and then you can decide later, you know what, I don't like that idea. I'm going to sell that stock, and you're done. So what if you invest in one of my portfolio companies today, you just closed on the round, and you decide later today you wish you wouldn't have made that investment? How long is it going to take to get out of that investment? Well, if you go the natural course, it might be five to ten years. <laughs> or if you have a real emergency, you might be able to get some greedy vulture capitalists to buy you out at a 75% discount, and it might take two or three months to get the paperwork done, and the due diligence, etc. So it's highly illiquid, um, lots of uncertainty there. So what am I saying? We've got to pay these investors that come into our fund better than 10%. If we could promise them 10%, they'd say, why would I do this? I'll go with publicly traded stocks that are very liquid, that have a track record, and I can invest in things I understand, I can invest in some of the leading management teams. I can invest in companies with some market power because their sales are in the billions instead of in the zeros. And um, so my challenge now is how do I put a portfolio of companies together where I can get more than 10%? And by the way, how much more than 10% do I have to get? Well, early stage venture over the long run has been averaging, and I don't even know what these numbers are today, but when I was teaching my class at the U of I up until a couple years ago, I'd update this all the time, a little over 20%. And that's kind of okay return. If you can get up into the 30% north, then you're a really good performer. You're the kind where investors would be lining up to put money in your fund. So how do we do that? Well, how, how high must returns be? So uh, the basic math is, uh, and just trust me on this a little bit, and I, I, I play with these numbers all the time. I'm, I'm an accountant still. Uh, four or five times uh, the investors return to get that internal rate of return over 20%, but if you don't even think about how IRR is calculated, there's a time factor to that too. So obviously that's out over a longer period of time, like eight or 10 years. Um, but if, if, I would say really by the time you call in capital and make the investments in stages and then sell it out in stages to different companies, your investors probably average holding of six or seven years. So maybe you don't have to get them four or five times back it's more like three. But still, it's a pretty big multiple. So how do we get there? Well, there's some techniques we use. One, we diversify. Angel investing is a crazy game. You put all your money in one company because it's your neighbor and you knew them and they go, which they've got probably a 50% chance or better of not succeeding. You just lost all your private money in one deal. Just like in public stocks, you can take some risk out of the portfolio without a commensurate drop in the, in the return by investing in at least 15 companies. That's short cut there on the logic, but we, our portfolio companies, our portfolios all have more than 20 companies in them, and we can take comfort that if we lose one, we still have 19 left still playing in the game. And uh, our failure rate so far, knock on wood, hasn't been as bad as the industry average, and I'm not exactly sure why, but um, I have some ideas. We also share the risk with other investors, so we almost almost never invest alone. We might, we might come into a seed round without another VC, but with some angels. But typically, like I'm working on a deal today, and uh, before we negotiated the term sheet, we called some other investors to see how likely they might uh, be to come in the round with us. So we have a pretty good idea before we even come in that there are going to be other investors participating. Why do we care about other investors? There's more money if things get tough. There are more brains if things get tough. So you want people around, and hopefully these other investors know something about that industry as well and bring something to the table. I'll move quickly here. We build in preferences. So what does that mean? This is where you got to get to learn about the terms. We will ask for certain, we will ask for preferred stock instead of the common stock that the founders have when they first start the corporation. And the preferences are as limited only by the imaginations of the people cutting the deal. But a common preference might be we want, uh, we want the right to choose to just get our money back if things don't go well 
when you sell versus taking our pro rata share. In other words, and um, um, we had uh, two big winners. We had two companies in that portfolio of 15 that went public, which was amazing for a small Midwestern venture fund to have two companies go public that both eventually reached that billion dollar valuation. So those two provided the bulk of the returns for that fund. And then we had several others that were somewhere between uh, break even and, uh, and seven or eight X. And um, uh, one of them was a four Xer, which doesn't sound all that interesting, except it happened really fast. We made the investment and a couple years later they sold it and everybody got four times their money back and that's not a bad way to go to and investors love getting a check. So that worked out really well. So a company has to have extreme growth to get to that kind of money that's a 10 Xer. So let's assume we buy 10% of a company with a million dollar investment. So we'll oversimplify it. I'm the only investor, which would probably not happen. So that means you've got a $9 million pre-money value and my money rounds the value up to 10. You brought $9 million worth of company, I brought $9 million worth of equity capital, which we immediately put in on the balance sheet in the form of cash. And now your company is a $10 million company and I own 10%. And I may have some preferences, but when you calculate the shares, I own 10%. So the company goes on to raise three more rounds at gradually increasing valuations. And I participate, but I don't hold on to all of it because we've got other investors putting money in. And I get diluted down to 6%. And this is just about typical right here. And uh, some dilution occurs. And the total investment I have is now $3 million. And then we kind of allow that kind of reserve when we make an investment in a company that will invest at least double what we put in our first fund, or our first tranche. And so how do I get 30 million back? That's, that's 10 times my money is 30 million. So now we've got to figure out together how you're going to pay my investors $30 million, 10 times the investment amount. That means we need to exit this company at a value of 500 million. So I came in with a $9 million company when you came to see me, which is a, probably sort of a typical early stage valuation these days. And we got to get it to 500 million. Uh, keep in mind, and this data is a couple years old, but back in 18, the average venture back tech company that exited did so at a valuation of around 60 million. So you got to be way better than average to make that happen. Tim and I have done some early deals where we got in so low that a 60 or 80 million dollar exit could be a big win, but that's harder to do when you get bigger and you have to write bigger checks. We were writing small checks on early stage companies then. So you can see where the pressure is on us. So I have to really believe you can get to that kind of a result. Here are the types of securities that we do real quickly. Uh, there's a lot of information out there uh, on how these all work, but typically we're investing in preferred stock or something that's going to turn into preferred stock, which means, and, and it's not like the preferred stock of Ford that is traded on the exchange, which is almost like debt. This is just a negotiated type of stock that has a preference over the commons. So if you look at the balance sheet, the commons at the very bottom of the equity section, preferred stock's right above it, but below all the debt. And if you look, if, if you're an accountant, you know this, when it comes time to liquidate a company, you pay the debts off first, just like at home. And then in this case, you pay the preferred shareholders unless they choose to convert to common. So when we talk about that preference, I get to choose to get my money back or to convert to common. And then if I convert to common, we all get paid together. And if it's, if it's a success, that's the way it will work. Also, if it goes public, the stock has to convert from preferred to common because you're only going to issue common shares on the exchange. That would be a happy day if it occurs. It's a lot of work. So we get preferred. Sometimes if a company's in a hurry and they have a smaller round to do, they don't want to get into all the negotiations of what that preferred stock round is going to be like, so they raise a convertible debt round. And they've done, we need some money. I just had this conversation with another one of my CEOs this morning, and she said, we're going to do a B round next year. We're going to need to do a bridge to tide us over later this year. So we're going to talk about this at our next board meeting. So uh, the investors around the table, probably just the internal investors, will throw a million or so into the company, and that'll carry them out for a while. B round next year, which will be a larger amount, and our convertible note will accrue a little bit of interest, and then when the round is done, it will convert at that round's price, but probably to a discount, which is our reward for coming in now, instead of just saying, yeah, I think I'll just wait for the B round and see how that goes. No, there's an incentive for me to put some money in right now, so I'll do that. There's another instrument which works almost like convertible notes. It's called a simple agreement for future equity, which also is called a SAFE. And that's like debt, only there's no terms, usually, no terms for payback. 
it's considered a permanent investment and it's considered equity. So it goes on the balance sheet right down with the equity. The idea is I'm putting the money in, but we're going to negotiate the terms later or we're going to determine the terms later when the next round occurs and it will convert. And originally safes were just that. Put the money in when the next round occurs, it's just going to convert. But then they started putting features into safes that were about like convertible notes. And, and these tend to track a lot. There are certain instances where a safe's a lot better for the entrepreneur and may not matter to the investor. And one is if you're getting um, matching grant money, if you're getting an SBIR uh, phase 2B, for example, and you need some matching money, uh, uh, the, say the National Science Foundation would like to see that in the form of a safe. That way you know it's permanent capital and you're not just borrowing some money to qualify for the, for the match and then you're going to have to pay it back. So uh, we've done several safes because that was better for the company. And it kind of, in the end, if everything charges along, we'll just convert that. And a lot of time, our safes now have a discount, just like with convertible note. And they might even accrue a dividend, which can get converted as well. Sometimes, but rarely, we'll just do common stock, especially if it's a brand new company. And uh, sometimes we'll get warrants and options, uh, especially if it was an incentive to participate in a round or for some services we might provide. And occasionally we'll even do a short-term loan. I did a short-term loan for a company last week just because they got in a pinch and some money they were expecting from a customer to even come in and we didn't have a payroll. They're too young to have a bank line of credit. We made them a loan and they'll pay us back later this week or next week. And just it's not what we'd like to do, but they were in a jam. <coughs> okay. So uh, a couple last points. Uh, low odds of getting venture capital. So don't beat yourself up when you get a no. It's a numbers game here. Uh, for every 100 companies we look at, 70 of them are probably tossed out right away. This is not a fit for us. Wrong stage, wrong industry, um, anything you can imagine. But 30 of them will get a look, a, a look, and 10 of them might even get a, uh, a second call or a meeting with the full team. And of those 10, after we get through the full team, maybe one of those will get funded. And um, we're getting uh, probably close to 100 a month deals coming to us right now. And we're going to invest in about 10 companies this year, this year. So maybe a little less than one a month. So now that's the bad news. The good news is there are hundreds of venture firms out there, and there are probably some that are a really good fit with yours. So you can improve these odds greatly. A bunch of those 70s are coming to us, and they're a C round with a $100 million pre or they're just way too early. By the way, if they're too early but interesting, we tell them that, hey, you're too early. Let's stay in touch. Go raise your money from angel investors and friends and family, but let's stay in touch and when you get to that A round, we'll take another look. So it's not necessarily a permanent no, but it can be tossed out. So uh, it's, a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a numbers game here. So the, the last question that I talk to my students about is, well, how do VCs themselves make money? I mean, you're a rich VC. How did you get all that money? Well, I'm not one of those California really rich VCs yet. Maybe one of these days. Uh, we have two streams of money that comes into our firm. One is the management fee, which sounds great on the face of it, but if we were, uh, if it's 2% of assets under management during the investment period, which is usually the first four or five years of managing a fund, and then it falls off pretty rapidly after that, and it stops at 10 years. But it's pretty small in that last couple of years. And you say, well, that's still pretty big money, but if we had a $100 million fund, we'd be spending all of it on the staff it would take to manage a $100 million fund, plus the travel and the rent and all the various costs that go with it. So I, I see very few funds that are well-managed that are making profits of anything meaningful on the management fee. That's really the cost to administer this on behalf of the investors. Where we hope to make our money is something that we call the carried interest or the carry. Typical terms are 2%, 2% 20. So we get a 2% management fee and we get a 20% carry. And the carry for early stage is usually just 20% of the profits once the investors get all their money back. So if you put a million dollars in my next fund, once I've given you distributions checks back, the total of that million dollars, in other words, you've paid all your investments and all your share of the expenses that came out of your money that went in, then we start splitting at 80 20. And you get 80% of the money. And I've been in funds where that was pretty modest money, uh, maybe rightfully so, but it was tough times. And I've seen people, I haven't experienced this yet, where the money <laughs> is out of control huge. That's what we're shooting for. So I see people that have done, uh, I, I mean, 
one of the recent Sequoia funds I was looking at returned seven and a half times the investor's money. So they get 20% of that extra six and a half times. And when you're talking about a $750 million or billion dollar fund, it's a lot of money to go around uh, to investors. And, uh, uh, and, and when that money comes to us, it doesn't go just to, to me and Tim and Robin Steve, it actually gets split among our team. And it's not unusual to share this with your anchor investors that help you get the fund started. So a little bit of that might go to a couple of our large investors. So uh, last slide here. Uh, network to get a warm introduction. Uh, think through why a VC would want to invest with you. I mean, if you're in the energy business, look at energy and firms that are doing investments in energy. If you're in the med tech business, look at firms that are just doing med technologies. In, in, within med, look at whether they're doing med data or whether they're doing devices or biotech. Figure it out so you're targeted. That's going to greatly improve your eyes so you won't be one of those 70 that are just tossed immediately. Uh, project your financials. Um, uh, be appropriately uh, aggressive and optimistic, but be reasonable so where you can defend your numbers. You don't want to be a uh, conservative curmudgeon on there and say, well, in 15 years, I think we can get to a million dollars of revenue. Nobody's going to want to invest in that. But if you really think you can grow this to a $100 million company over the next five years, show how you're going to do it in and demonstrate what it's going to take to get there and share those with your investors. Try to be open-minded and easy to work with. Some of the best advice I got when I went to a workshop on fundraising for venture capital funds, the professor from Wharton that taught the workshop, um, she told us, your first goal in that first face-to-face -face meeting is to get them to like you. If they don't like you, I can promise you that, if I don't like you, I am not going to invest with you. <laughs> This is hard stuff. We're going to have to work together for years to make this work. So you've got to get them to like you. And if your business is interesting, even if you don't get to the deck, that's almost the best thing that could have happened. Talk about the deck later. But get them to like you. And then start that relationship. And don't be afraid to admit that you don't know everything. I tell you, I love it when I get people in and say, I'm a software person. I don't know anything about venture capital. Uh, I've got some advisors that are going to help me but just bear with me a little bit. One, one of my favorite, I'm not gonna name names, one of my favorite entrepreneurs here in town that I invested in is a professor. And he came to me and I said, well, what's your gross profit margin? And he said, explain to me what you mean by that question. <laughs> and he's a professor and not a business professor. And so I, marked, I wrote it out on the board and we got right to the answer and he understood gross profit margin after that. And uh, that's what I love about him is he's not afraid to ask the question, but he's, really good at understanding the technology and what the customers want. And that's really, well, that's what I can do. And so uh, if you're rejected, uh, it's okay to ask for feedback. It's okay to ask for referrals. Don't be obnoxious about asking for the referrals. Try to get a sense of why we rejected you. If we rejected you because we don't like you and we don't have anything to do with your industry, don't ask me for a referral. I'm probably not gonna give you one. But if I say, you know, I love what you're doing and I think I could help, but the timing is not right. But I might know some people that can help you. And that happens a lot. So, that's my speech, it's one o'clock. Um, if anybody wants to stick around and ask a question or two, I can stick around for a little while. Do we have time for a question or should we? Yeah, if anybody wants to stick around for a minute, I can take a question.